Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm really glad to be with you. Thank you. Let me uh, start. I've made this observation like three times. Have you been to any of my events today? You're, you're going to say, I already said that. But I'm going to say it again. It's cold. Okay? <laughs> And I don't want to hear this all anywhere you're from Florida. I, I've been saying, hey, it's really cold. Oh, because you're from Florida. Come on, it's cold. You're, you know you're cold. I don't know how long you've lived here. You know it's cold. I remember the, two nights ago we were spending the night here in Iowa, and uh, the newscast came on. Watching the, the Packers, Cardinals, that end of the newscast came on. And basically the newscast was, the, the whole newscast was this. It's going to be really cold tonight and tomorrow morning. Everything is closed and canceled. If you spend more than five minutes outside, you're going to lose a limb. And if your car breaks down in this weather, you're going to die. So stay indoors. And uh, that's when I thought, oh, great. We're going to campaign on that, you know? So, um, it's, uh, but look, it's been great. It's an honor to be with you. And I really thank you all for coming out and listening to me today. You're here because I think, you know, what I do. And that is that the 2016 election is going to be a turning point in American history. All of our elections are, but this one in particular. And I'm here today to earn your support in the caucus, which is now just two weeks from, from today, to 14 days away. It's going to be a turning point in our history because the bottom line is that we are right now a great country headed in the wrong direction. I believe, I think you, many of you do as well, we are a great nation in decline. In essence, our children are on the verge of being the first Americans ever that inherit a country worse off than the one their parents had. I'm not happy about it, I know you're not happy about it, and it doesn't have to be the outcome. We have to remind ourselves first and foremost of how special this country is. This is a unique country in the history of mankind. Do you realize that almost everyone that ever lived, lived in a society where their future was decided for them? Where society said to you, you can only be whatever your parents were. So if your parents were rich and famous people, you were rich and famous. And if your parents weren't, you were stuck. Living in a society that said you can only go as far as the people that came before you went. Now, for those of us who live in this country, we don't know what that feels like. Unless you've lived somewhere else. Unless you're reminded of it constantly. And we need to be a country that once again reminds our children and each other how special this nation truly is. It was founded on a powerful, powerful truth. That our rights do not come from our leaders and our rights do not come from our government. Our rights come from our creator. They come from God. That's where our rights come from. Earlier this morning, or earlier today, I had a gentleman came out. Uh, I should have known he had a t-shirt that said uh, something atheist. So he was an atheist. I knew it was from the t-shirt. But then he told me because he asked a question. And uh, he wanted to know what was I going to do. He felt uncomfortable because I talked about my faith and he was an atheist. I said, don't worry. You are free to believe anything you want or nothing at all. But I said to him, you have to understand something. America does not make sense unless we be believe in a creator because our founding, we were founded on a principle that our rights come from God to life, to liberty, to pursue happiness. That video is out there. You should be able to find it. I hope you'll watch it. Because it was an important moment. Our rights come from our creator. What did that lead to? It led to free enterprise. The only economic model in the history of the world where we can make poor people richer without making rich people poorer. It made us the most prosperous people in history. It led to individual liberties, which means we've been the freest people in history. And the result was the American miracle, a unique nation unlike any other, where for 200 years, each generation has left the next better off. But now things feel different. For a growing number of Americans, the common refrain is, I don't recognize my country anymore. A recent poll found that 50% of young Americans, millennials, said they no longer believe in the American dream. They think it's dead. Why is this happening? And it goes to deep, just beyond what's happening in our daily lives. I believe it happened beginning in 2008. When we elected a president that didn't want to fix the problems in America, we elected a president that wanted to change America. And maybe some of you think, well, that, that goes too far. That's not true. Well, I think the last seven years proves that it is true. We have a president that does not believe in free enterprise, at least not the way I do who views free enterprise as a system where only a handful of people make all the money, everyone else gets left behind, and the only way you can make money is if you're cheating someone. So he undermines free enterprise. We have a president that doesn't view the Constitution the way I do and most of you do. He views it as a living and breathing document that's supposed to be interpreted the way you feel like interpreting it at any given moment in our history. 
And so he undermines the Second Amendment. He undermines religious liberties. We have a president that views America as an arrogant global power, in essence, a nation that needed to be cut down to size. That's how you get a president that apologizes for America on at least 10 separate occasions throughout his presidency around the world. He's apologized for America. That's how you get a military that today is being systematically reduced in a way that is dangerous. And that is how you get a foreign policy in which we cut deals with our enemies but betray our allies. And that's why people are so frustrated. It's real. I think you see it in both parties, but it is real. People are angry at Washington, D.C. and at both political parties. And the reason is because Washington has never been more out of touch than it is right now. I've only been there four and a half, five years. It didn't take long to figure that out. In fact, I figured that out before I even got there. In 2009, I was a private citizen. I had just ended eight years in the Florida legislature. Term limits kicked in. I left. I was the Speaker of the House. And I went home to be a private citizen. And then this opening occurred in the Senate. This was right after Obama got elected. And I knew then, I ran for office, go back and find the videos. I said, he is trying to fundamentally change America. I want my next U.S. Senator to be someone that will stand up to that. And the Republican Party rolled out the sitting governor of Florida. Now, I worked with that governor. It wasn't Jeb Bush, it was Charlie Crist. I worked with him. I was the speaker when he was governor. And I knew he would not stand up to Obama. In fact, I knew he would support many of the things Obama was doing to change America. He, at the time, was part of this movement that said, if Republicans want to win, they have to become more like the Democrats. I never believed that. I said, there's always, there's already a Democrat party. Why do we need two Democrat parties? And so I decided to run against them. The only people that thought I could win at the time, at the beginning, all lived in my house. And four of them were under the age of 10. The entire Republican establishment in Washington, I mean literally, the entire Republican leadership of the Senate didn't just support him, they warned me not to run, but we did anyways. And we came from 50 points down in the polls, didn't know how I was going to raise the money. Not only did we beat him, before the primary he switched to become an independent. Then, a couple years later, he became a Democrat. Now he's a vegetarian. He's been all over the place. <laughs> So comes 2014, 15, earlier last year, I decide I'm running for president. We, our next president has to be someone as committed to undoing the Obama agenda as Obama was in imposing the Obama agenda. And the same people, the same people in the leadership and the establishment came forward and said, you can't run. Why? So you haven't waited long enough. You have to wait in line. We promote the next person in line. That's how we do things in the party. I said, you're out of your mind. Wait for what? After seven years of Barack Obama, this is no time for patience. Our next president can't just be the next person in line. It has to be someone truly committed, not just to undoing the damage, but also embracing the opportunity of this new era. It's time to turn the page for our party and for our country. And so I decided to run for president. And that's why I'm in this race now. I'm in this race because I'm frustrated about the direction of America as well. I'm frustrated because many of the issues we face in this country that are not solved and that this president's made worse, I faced in my life. When I talk to students about student loans, I didn't read about it in a book. I'm not responding to a magazine article. I had student loans. Like three years ago, I still had student loans, over $100,000 in student loans. Now, I was able to pay them off because I was able to write a book. It's called An American Son. Now available on paperback. Are you interested? <laughs> I know how crippling that can be. I care deeply about the fact that millions of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. You know why? Not because I read about it in a book. Because I grew up paycheck to paycheck. And Jeanette and I lived paycheck to paycheck. And many of the people in my family whom we love dearly live paycheck to paycheck now. They're firefighters, they're nurses, they're teachers, and they live paycheck to paycheck. Imagine people that are making even less. And when I talk about the need for how hard it is and I want to help parents with the costs and the challenges of raising a family in the 21st century, that's not something I saw in a documentary. Jeanette and I are doing that right now. We are raising four children in the 21st century. We are blessed to have four children, and we are raising them. And let me tell you, we have to work harder than ever to ensure that those children grow up with the values that we want to teach them, not the values they're trying to ram down our throat every single day 
And every TV station, every movie, the music, the popular culture, it's a constant fight to ensure that they are picking up the right values so they can succeed. And so I'm frustrated that not only have these problems not gotten solved, I'm frustrated that America has been weakened around the world, that our reputation has been damaged by this president. And our next president better be someone that is fired up about this reality. Our next president better be someone that is as frustrated about this issue as you are, and we are, and I am. But being frustrated about this will not be enough. Basically, being frustrated alone will not be enough. Our next president has to know exactly what they're going to do about it. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. I want to tell you very clearly what I will do if not only you caucus for me, but I come back in November and you elect me president, I'm going to tell you exactly what we're going to do. I'm not just going to tell you we're going to make things better. I'm going to tell you how we're going to make things better. It'll begin in my very first moments in office. I'm going to place my left hand on the Bible and my right hand in the air, and I'm going to swear to defend and protect and uphold the Constitution of the United States. And unlike our current president, I actually will mean it. And what does that mean? It means you're not going to get executive orders from me that ignore the Constitution. No matter how good the idea may be, I will never undermine our republic to achieve it. What it means is we're going to have an attorney general that defends the Constitution, not conspires to undermine it. Not an attorney general that goes to the Oval Office to see what can we do to get in the way of your Second Amendment rights. My attorney general will defend your Second Amendment rights. It means we'll appoint justices to the Supreme Court and judges to the federal bench that will apply the Constitution, not ignore it, manipulate it, or reinterpret it. It means we will defend the Second Amendment right of every American and the religious liberties of every American to live out the meaning and the teaching of their faith in every aspect of their life when I am president. We will defend that Constitution, for it is the underpinnings, it is the, the base, it is the foundation of our very republic. When I get to the Oval Office after taking the oath of office that day, I am going to repeal every single one of Barack Obama's unconstitutional executive orders. What that means is all of these crazy EPA rules that are doing nothing to protect our environment but are destroying manufacturing and farming and American business Every single one of those crazy EPA rules, they are gone on my first day in office. We're going to put local school districts and parents and principals and teachers back in charge of school curriculum, not the Department of Education, because on my first day in office, any federal efforts to force you to take Common Core as opposed to control your own curriculum, on my first day in office, that's gone. On my first day in office, this ridiculous, this dangerous, this counterproductive deal with the Ayatollah and Iran, I will cancel that deal on my first day in office as President of the United States. That deal is gone. By the way, there are things I'll be able to do as President. Not, they won't require me to sign a bill or a law or power, give anything. But I will use the influence of this office to improve the way our government works. The founders of this nation were geniuses. The framers of our Constitution were geniuses, blessed by providence to be at the same place at the same time. And they created for us in Article 5 of the Constitution a process where you can take control of the federal government if it runs amok. I think the time has come to take control. And let me tell you how you can do it. Through a convention of the states. A convention of the states, not a runaway convention of the states, a convention of the states that allow you to put in place provisions in the Constitution that you want to see done that you know Congress never will do. So for example, a convention of the states that will only be able to do three or four things like these. A balanced budget amendment, term limits on Congress, and term limits on the federal judiciary. As President, I will support your efforts to call that convention of the states so once and for all we can have term limits and a balanced budget amendment here in America. We're going to empower 
the private economy to create jobs again. The jobs that are being created now don't pay enough. It's that simple. And no law of government can pass can force businesses to pay people more. They'll just create less jobs. You make a person more expensive than a machine in the 21st century, a machine will replace them. You make a person more expensive than a machine in a fast food restaurant, that automation that's already happening is going to happen even faster. Here's a better approach. Make America the best place in the world to create better paying jobs. That's why we need tax reform, regulatory reform. That's why we need to balance our budget and save Social Security and Medicare to bring our debt under control. That's why we need to fully utilize our energy resources, all of them. And if we do those things, there will be no place on earth better for creating jobs in America. We do what needs to be done. America will once again be the single greatest place in the world to create the best paying jobs of the new economy. We'll do that when I'm president. When I'm president, we're going to deal with Obamacare. We're going to deal with it once and for all. Now look, everybody running for president is a Republican is against Obamacare. I believe them, but I'm the only one that's ever done anything about it. Meaningful, not a long speech, something real. Here's what it was. A lot of people didn't even know this. When they passed Obamacare, they cut a deal with the big insurance companies. And they said, we're going to create a bailout fund for you if you'll support Obamacare. So that if you guys lose money in the Obamacare plans, the taxpayer will bail you out. Pretty good deal. Well, in 2014, I led the effort, and we got rid of that bailout fund. And we saved the taxpayers $2 billion. And now the columnists and other experts are saying, they think they're hurting me by saying this, but they're saying, Marco Rubio did a terrible thing. He got rid of the bailout fund, and that's going to lead to Obamacare's collapse. Yes, I hope so. <laughs> but whether it does or doesn't, when I'm president, we're going to get rid of Obamacare, and we're going to replace it. We're going to put you in charge of your health care decisions. We're going to put you in charge of what kind of insurance you buy. You will control your health care money, whether it came from your employer or it's a refundable tax credit, and you will be able to use it to buy any insurance from any company in any state in America. Not the government. You will control your health care choices again. And I'm President of the United States. An issue we talk a lot about in this campaign and over the last 30 years is immigration. And I understand this issue better than anyone running for president. Because my father was an immigrant, my mother was an immigrant, my grandparents were immigrants, all of my neighbors are immigrants, I grew up in a community of immigrants, and my wife's entire family are immigrants. I know every aspect of this issue. I know the good, the bad, the ugly. I know the story of people that are in this country illegally. And if you knew their story, it would break your heart. And I know the story of people that came to this country legally. And if you found out what they were doing, you would be outraged. And vice versa. This is a complicated but important issue. So let me tell you three things about it. The first is the issue has changed in the following way. There is now a radical Sunni jihadist group, ISIS, which has shown a pretty sophisticated understanding of the immigration practices of other countries. And they are working hard to get killers into Europe, and we suspect into the United States as well, right? To use the refugee crisis, to use visa waiver programs. The killer in San Bernardino came in as a fiance on a visa. Legal, not illegal. You have a sophisticated radical jihadist group trying to infiltrate America. Our number one priority on immigration must be to keep ISIS out. And when I'm president, we will do everything we can to achieve it. And here's how. It's not about profiling. It's not about discriminating against any religion. I don't believe in religious tests. Here's what we're going to do. If we do not know who you are 100% for sure, and we do not know why you are coming for 100% certainty, when I'm president, if we're not 100% sure of who you are and why you're coming, you will not get into the United States of America. The second thing is, as the son of immigrants, the grandson of immigrants, and a community of immigrants, I can speak with authority when I say this. Enforcing our immigration laws is not anti-immigrant. It's just what sovereign countries do. All of them do it. We're going to do it when I'm president. For the first time in 30 years, it will be real. What does that mean? It means 20,000 new border agents. We don't have enough border agents. It means finishing the 700 miles of fencing and walls that Congress never completed. 
It means technology on key sectors of the border that we know people are using to traffic guns and traffic drugs and traffic people and potentially even terrorists one day. It means a mandatory e-verify system. So if you're here illegally, you can't get a job. Shuts off the jobs magnet. It means a biometric entry-exit tracking system to prevent people from overstaying visas. That's 40% of the problem right there. If we do all of those things, illegal immigration will decline rapidly. We will bring it under control. And we'll deal with the rest of immigration. And we'll be reasonable about it. We're not going to have amnesty. There has to be consequences for violating our immigration law, and there will be. If you're a criminal alien, you're going to be immediately deported. If you're a sanctuary city, you will lose your federal funding. But for the first time in 30 years... <laughs> last but not least is the most important thing the federal government does. And the most important thing the federal government does is national security. It is, in fact, the reason why we have a federal government. We don't have a federal government to run our schools. I don't even believe we need a federal department of education. We need to turn it over to the school districts. Schools belong to you in the local level, not the federal government. We don't need a national school board. But national security, that's the federal government's job. And it's failing. The world is a dangerous place. I don't need to tell you that, but let's walk through it briefly. North Korea is governed by a lunatic. And it would be funny if it wasn't for the fact that he possesses nuclear weapons and long-range missiles and maybe even now a hydrogen bomb. The Chinese are undertaking, and I mean the Chinese government, not the Chinese people. The Chinese government is undertaking the most rapid military buildup in human history. They are actively hacking into our computers, and they steal the secrets of our companies. 60 Minutes had a deal on this yesterday. You may have seen it, some of you. It's an outrage. You, you do business in China, they steal your, the way you do it, and then they start doing it themselves. You do business with China, you have to give them access to your information. Then in Europe, Vladimir Putin is a complete, complete cost-benefit analysis actor who has sensed weakness in Barack Obama, so he's become more aggressive than ever. Their economy's in shambles, but they're still increasing defense spending. What does that tell you about his intentions? And then Iran, Iran is about to get $100 billion of sanctions relief. And that money, they're going to spend it not on roads and bridges. They're going to spend it on building their military, sponsoring terrorist groups like Hezbollah, supporting killers like Assad. And ultimately, they're going to buy or build a nuclear weapon of their own. And they're already building long-range missiles that can one day hit the United States. And then on top of that, you have ISIS. They are not, as the president described them at the State of the Union, a bunch of bearded men on the back of a pickup truck. ISIS is located in over a dozen countries now with real affiliates. ISIS now, today, is recruiting people in the United States. Homegrown violent extremists, they're trying to inspire online. ISIS today is sending fighters back into Europe to destabilize that part of the world. And in the face of all these threats, what's happening? What's happening is defense cuts or reductions in defense spending that are completely unacceptable and leave us vulnerable. Where do they leave us? If we keep spending what we're spending now in the military, we will soon have the, old, the smallest army since the end of the Second World War. We will have the smallest navy in over 100 years. And we will have the smallest air force and the oldest airplanes in our history. For me, it is inexplicable how in the face of this reality, there are some people running for president as Republicans who in the past have supported spending even less because it was politically popular a couple years ago to say, oh, I'm for cutting everything, including the Pentagon. And now we see the consequences. So the first thing we're going to do when I'm president and it comes to national security is we're going to rebuild the U.S. military. And you know why? Because the world is a safer and a better place when America is the strongest military on the planet. Then we're going to have a real war on terror. Not a rhetorical war on terror, a real world war on terror, and one we're going to win. And here's how the war is going to be. The best intelligence agencies in the world, those of the United States, are going to tell us who the terrorists are and where they are. And then the most capable military in the world, working with our allies, are going to find them and destroy them. And if we capture these terrorists alive, 
They're not going to be read their Miranda rights. They're not going to get a lawyer. They're not going to get a court hearing in Manhattan. If we capture these terrorists alive, they are going to get a one-way ticket to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. And by the way, in Guantanamo, we are going to find out everything they know. Everything they know. We're certainly not going to be releasing them like Obama is to rejoin the battlefield against us. And one more point on national security. We are going to, keep, we are going to honor the men and women who have served us in uniform. If you are a veteran and you are here today, we want to stop as it is always appropriate and thank you for your service to this country. We thank you very much. The way we're treating our veterans is immoral. We have a record number of veterans unemployed, a record number of veterans homeless, record number of veterans committing suicide, record number of veterans waiting in long waiting lists to see a doctor at the VA. This is an outrage. First of all, when I'm president, we're going to make it easier for our veterans to take the skills they learned in the military and apply them in civilian life. For example, if you, were a law, if you were a trucker in the military and you were hauling explosives on a dirt road in Afghanistan, I think you're qualified to haul eggs on the interstate highway system of the United States. We're going to make it easier for you to get a commercial license to do that. And on and on on the other skills. The second thing is, we have good people at the VA. We should recognize there are really good people that work at the VA, they care about our veterans, and they do a great job. And then we've got some people at the VA that are not doing their job. When I'm president at the VA, if you're at the VA and you're not doing a good job, you will be fired, not promoted, not a bonus, you will be fired if you are not doing your job at the VA. And when I'm president and you're a veteran, your VA benefits are going to belong to you. You know what that means? It means this, when I am President of the United States, our veterans will be able to take their VA benefits to any hospital or any doctor they want to, because the benefit will belong to them, not to the government. Was that for dramatic effect? I, I bet you somebody leaned on the light. Here it comes. More light, please. Yes, that's what I was about to do. Was gonna, I felt like Dean Martin or Sinatra or something. All right. So what song do you like? I mean, <laughs> All right. Well, anyway. Um, let there be light. Right? <laughs> Let's see if it works this time. Look, um, it's hard for me to, to acknowledge this, but... I think it's important to acknowledge our, and be realistic about our challenges. After seven years of Barack Obama, and really these problems predate him, but they've really gotten worse over the last seven years, America's a great nation in decline. It is. If we stay on the road we are on right now, you're going to have to explain to your kids, and I to mine, why we got to grow up in the greatest nation in the history of the world, and they inherit a country worse off than the one we got. They'll be the first Americans ever that it happened to. And it will be to the shame of all of us if that happens. After seven years, we are a great nation rapidly in decline. Here's the good news. It doesn't have to change. It doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't have to be this way. We are not a weak people. We are not a weak nation. We just have a weak president, a bad president. And we can change that this year. And that's what this election is going to be about. That's why we can't afford to elect Hillary Clinton. To begin with, we can't afford another four years like the last seven. Second, she's disqualified from being Commander-in-Chief of the United States. She's disqualified. She knew what happened in Benghazi was a terrorist attack, an orchestrated terrorist attack. She knew it. You know how we know she knew it? Because she was emailing people, foreign leaders and family members. And then she told the families of those four victims, those brave Americans, oh, this was because of a YouTube video. 
Who, how can you lie to the families of these brave Americans and then ask to be commander in chief? Hillary Clinton is disqualified from being commander in chief of the United States because she lied about Benghazi. And I can't wait to run against her. She doesn't want to run against me, I can promise you. you. You know how you know this? After every debate, after every day, they attack me more than any other Republican, constantly, on everything, on, on anything you can imagine. Why? Because she does not want to run against me. She knows she'll lose. But I can't wait to run against her. And I ask you to give me the opportunity to do that, because I run against her, we will beat her. We will defeat Hillary Clinton. Or whoever they nominate, for that matter. They got another guy running, too. You may have heard of him. But we can't just nominate any Republican either. Our nominee has to be someone that can unite this party. In the end, we can't win unless we're not all together. We'll have our differences, but we have to be united. We can't afford to lose anyone. Number two, we have to add new people. Who we have now is not enough. That means we must reach out to people that have been voted for us in the past, not by changing our principles, but by convincing them that limited government and free enterprise is better for them than what the other side offers. And we will do that in this campaign. We will campaign to college students and young Americans that are facing student loans, and I do. No other candidate doing it does. We will campaign to the single mothers that are making $12 an hour and struggling with raising their children, and you're only gonna get a raise if they can go back to school, but they can't. We have answers for that, and they don't involve big government. We will campaign to those who have lost their jobs at a factory or blue collar workers because the Obama administration with more taxes, more regulations has wiped those jobs out and sent them overseas. We will unite our party and we will grow it. And ultimately, our nominee and our president needs to be someone that will unite our country. Not someone that seeks to divide us against each other. Not someone that pits you against someone else in this country for political gain. We will have our differences and we will have debate over those differences. But I will never seek to divide the American people against each other for political gain the way Barack Obama has done. I will be a president for all Americans. We had protesters at the last debate outside, not debate, uh, the town hall we did. It was really cold, so I don't know how long they were out there. But give them credit, it was cold and they were protesting about all kinds of stuff. I didn't see them, but I heard about it. And they said, what do you think about it? I said, I'm going to cut their taxes too. <laughs> and I'm going to keep their families safe as well. I will be a president for all Americans. Because what we have before us here is an incredible challenge and opportunity. In the end, for me, what motivates me to do this every single day is that America owes me nothing, but I have a debt to America I'll never repay. This is the country that literally changed the history of my family. The United States of America is not just the country I was born in. It's the country that changed the history of my family. My parents came here in 1956. My father stopped going to school when he was nine years old because his mother died. He never went back to school. He would work for the next 70 years of his life. When they came here in 1956, they barely spoke any English at the time, had no real formal education, didn't know anyone, had no money or anything. You know that uh, the lore in our family was that one of my cousins, who had been here a year earlier, had learned a little English, and she phonetically spelled out on a piece of paper, I'm looking for work, or I'm looking for a job. It's not clear, but it was one. Those are the first words my father ever learned to say in English, really. And they struggled. It was hard those first few years here. But they persevered. You know that less than 10 years after my parents came here with nothing, working as a bartender, he owned a home in a safe and stable neighborhood? You know that less than 30 years after they came here, they were able to retire with dignity and security? That they were able to raise four children and leave all four of them with a better life and more opportunities than they themselves ever had? There's no nation on earth that would have been possible except here. Because this is a special country, unlike any in the history of the world. And you know why this country was special? It wasn't automatic, it didn't happen on its own. It was special because for over 200 years, each generation of Americans did what they had to do. The Americans that came before us didn't have it easy. Your grandparents didn't have it easy. Your great-grandparents didn't have it easy. Your parents didn't have it easy, and many of you have not had it easy. This nation has always confronted great challenges in each generation. But ours is the story of a country where each generation, when the time came to do the right thing, they did the right thing. 
They confronted their challenges. They didn't leave them for their children. And they embraced their opportunities. They didn't let them pass them by. And that is why for over 200 years, ours is the story of a nation in which each generation has left the next better off. Now the time has come for us to do our part. Now the moment has arrived for this generation to do that. And that's what we're going to do when I'm president. When I'm president of the United States, we are going to confront our challenges. We are going to solve our problems. We are going to re-embrace the principles that made America great. And we are going to apply them to the challenges of this new era. And if we do, that American dream that some people are starting to doubt, that American dream will not just survive if we do what needs to be done. I believe that American dream can reach more people and change more lives than ever before. If we do what needs to be done, I believe that this new century can be better than the one we leave behind. I believe the 21st century can be better than the 20th. That we have a chance to make of it a new American century. That is the task before us and that is what we will do. But first we must choose to do that. And that's what this election is, a generational choice about our identity as a nation and as a people. And that's why I'm here to ask you to caucus for me. We have a lot of good people running, but no one running for president is better prepared on day one to keep us safe. No one has a better understanding or shown better judgment on the foreign policy issues before us than I have. And no one running is more passionate about preserving the greatness of America and expanding it than I am. Give me a chance to be your president. Vote for me in these caucuses, and every single day I will work to keep you safe and to make America prosperous so that together, in this generation, we can be the authors of the single greatest chapter in the amazing story of America. Thank you for coming today, guys. God bless you all. Thank you.